All right, good morning. I'm glad that you're here. We're in the book of 1 Thessalonians this morning. We're continuing our, our series, and we're in chapter 3. I'm going to read 1 Thessalonians chapter 3, uh, verses 1 through 3 to start. I'm finding it interesting, the um, comparison of our separation uh, during this time, and Paul talking about his, his separation from the church at Thessalonica. It's a common thing. He, he just was not able to, to come and uh, how, he, how he dealt with it. So let's read 1 Thessalonians chapter 3, starting in verse 1. Wherefore, when we could no longer forbear, we thought it good to be left at Athens alone and sent Timotheus, our brother and minister of God and our fellow laborer in the gospel of Christ, to establish you and to comfort you concerning your faith, that no man should be moved by these afflictions. For yourselves know that we are appointed thereunto. So, he says, I can't come, uh, but I, I want to help you. I want to establish you. Uh, the wherefore that he starts with there in chapter 3, of course, comes from, from chapter 2, uh, how much he cares for them. He's been like a mother and a brother and a father. Uh, he loves them. Uh, but he says, I can't come, but I want to see you established, and, and I don't want to see you fail, is what he's saying there in verse 3, that, that no man should be moved by these afflictions. You know, in thinking about that, uh, the difficulty we're going through right now, you know, I would hate to see Christians fall away from the Lord uh, because they can't gather together in the way that we're used to. Uh, I would love to see Christians and people in our church uh, growing in the ministry and seeing that it's not just somebody else that has to do something. Uh, we've got to be part of, of the ministry of, of the Lord. And Paul, even though he couldn't come and see the Thessalonians, uh, did some things. And one of the things that we read there in, in verse 2, he sent a helper. Now, uh, we have a lot of means of doing that nowadays that, that he didn't have. <laughs> but uh, he sent... Timotheus. And the reason he could send Timotheus was that Paul could trust him. Uh, Timotheus, Timothy, uh, was, a, was a godly man. There's several times you'll read in Paul's letters where he sent Timothy uh, to minister when he couldn't be there. Uh, to the Philippians, you'll read in Philippians chapter 2. Uh, to the Corinthians, in uh, 1 Corinthians uh, chapter 4, he said, For this cause have I sent unto you Timotheus, who is my beloved son and faithful in the Lord. Now, what a great testimony. Uh, I, I hope that's my testimony to others. And uh, that's the kind of testimony that we want to have. What kind of person could be sent to help? That's the kind of person we want to be. And there in, in verse 2, it describes Timothy. Uh, number one, he's a saved person. Our brother. Uh, in uh, 2 Timothy chapter 1, Paul comments that he has a very strong testimony of salvation when he says, I call to remembrance the unfeigned faith that is in thee. 2 Timothy 1 verse 5. Uh, his faith was real. People, when they saw Timothy, they would say, that's a real Christian. <laughs> uh, he was a saved person. Secondly, he was a minister of God. He was a servant, had a servant's heart. You know, it's not just anybody you can ask to serve. It's got to be a person who's, who's willing to, to do it. And Timothy was a person who was like Jesus. Jesus had said to the disciples, Whosoever will be great among you, let him be your minister. And Jesus lived that. You see that when Jesus washed the disciples' feet. And he said in, in Matthew 20 that he came not to be ministered unto, but to minister and to give his life a ransom for many. That was the attitude Jesus had. It was that of a servant. And then if you, if you want a three-point outline, saved, servant, and sweat. <laughs> and he was a fellow laborer. Uh, for us to be used of the Lord, to, to be the one that someone could send, uh, we can't be afraid of work. We've got to be willing to, uh, to get in and get our, our hands dirty. Uh, we need to ask ourselves, do we have these qualities? Uh, could we have been the Timothy that God would have sent when, uh, when, he, when people needed help? You know, the situation we're in, th there's folks who need help. Maybe you're the one who can, can be of help to them. 
Well, what needs to be done? There in verse 2 as well. He sent him to establish you and to comfort you concerning your faith. Two main things. To establish you and to comfort you. The word establish means to strengthen. It's actually the word fixed. Fixed in the sense of fastened down. You know, as Christians, uh, we don't want to be wandering in, in our beliefs, in, in our attitudes. Later on in Thessalonians 5, verse 21, he says, Prove all things. Hold fast that which is good. Well, the way you prove things is you go to God's Word and see, well, what does God say? And then you put it into action. Uh, the, the job that needs to be done is we need to be established. That needs to be true in our lives. But it also needs to be true in our ministry uh, to others. We don't want to be, like James talks about, unstable. We don't want to be those who lack wisdom, uh, those who are wavering, or those who are double-minded, James said. A double-minded man is unstable in all his ways. And the way we do that is we use God's Word. Is To be stable, we need to uh, see, well, what does God say? He said not only to establish them, but to comfort them concerning their faith. That word comfort means to encourage. Uh, we need people who are encouragers. You know, it's really easy to point out faults, but it, it takes a, a special gift to, to encourage someone then to, to do right and to go on. There was no comfort around these folks. These were people, he describes them in chapter 1, verse 9, as people who had turned to God from idols. So they had, they had stepped away from their comfort zone. They'd grown up idol worshipers. So the people they knew, the, the culture they knew was idol worship. They'd stepped out of that. They couldn't go back to that. They couldn't get comfort from those people. They were now their enemies. And so they had to get comfort from the Lord. And he says, comfort you concerning your faith. Uh, it's like today. You know, the Lord wants us to rely on Him. And we can't look for comfort we can't expect our comfort to come from our situation or from the world. Jesus said to His disciples, These things I've spoken unto you, that in Me you might have peace. He says, I've given you these words, so you'll have peace. In the world ye shall have tribulation, but be of good cheer. I have overcome the world. So we need to be able to find comfort from the Lord. We need to be able to give comfort. To others. We need to be that one who can be that, that minister. There definitely was a conflict. Uh, look at verse 4 of 1 Thessalonians 3. For verily when we were with you, we told you before that we should suffer tribulation, even as it came to pass, and you know. For this cause, when I could no longer forbear, I sent to know your faith, lest by some means the tempter have tempted you, and our labor be in vain. In those verses you can see uh, the kind of trouble they were experiencing. Uh, some on the outside. Uh, affliction, he calls it in verse 3. Uh, in verse 4, he calls it tribulation. Later on in uh, verse 7, he'll call it affliction and distress. Uh, some of you understand what he means by that word distress. Um, and, and it's interesting in verse 3, he says, Yourselves know that we are appointed thereunto. Now that might be referring just specifically to Paul, but uh, you know as Christians... Uh, the Bible says, all that live godly in Christ Jesus shall suffer persecution. And God warns us, uh, there's going to be conflict. Uh, there's just the normal conflict of life, just of living. But then there's the conflict of, of being a Christian. The other difficulty they faced was in verse 5, and that's temptations within. Uh, the tempter having tempted you. Uh, Satan does that. That's what he does. <laughs> when Jesus was tempted in Matthew 4, it describes him when the tempter came. That's, that's Satan. Uh, James, I think it is, tells us uh, when we're tempted, we're not tempted of God. God is not the one trying to get us to fail, get us to sin. Satan is. And he's very subtle. That, that's an interesting word that God uses uh, to describe Satan's temptation in 2 Corinthians 11 and verse 3. 2 Corinthians 11.3 I fear lest by any means as the serpent beguiled Eve through his subtlety so your mind should be corrupted from the simplicity that is in Christ. 
Uh, Satan is very subtle. Uh, he doesn't say, oh, quit being a Christian and be an atheist. He says, just, just change a little bit. Just give here. Just give a, uh, it won't make any difference. Uh, he's very subtle. He beguiles us. And uh, we need to be careful that we're listening to the Lord. We need to be encouraging each other in the Lord and uh, seeing, helping each other uh, to be established and to be comforted. Uh, the things we're going through right now will have many uh, tribulations and afflictions and distresses. Uh, there'll be some difficult things, but we need to let them drive us closer to the Lord, not further away from the Lord. Don't let Satan uh, corrupt you from the simplicity that's in Christ. Uh, there'll be subtle temptations, uh, things where you'll want to just give a little in, in your faith. Uh, don't give a little, uh, give more. Grow in the Lord during, during these times. One of the things Paul did when he was not able to go himself was he sent a helper. And Timothy was that faithful one that God used to, uh, to comfort and encourage and, and instruct him. Uh, they were under attack. They needed help. Let me encourage you. Get help. Uh, there's help available. Uh, there's people that can come and, and can help you. Uh, but as well, be a help. You know, there's folks who need you to be an encouragement to them. The second thing he did, Paul not only sent a helper, he wrote a letter. Now the reason we know that is we have it right here. <laughs> uh, after Timothy came back and gave his report, that's when Paul wrote 1 Thessalonians. Now, I don't guess on the letterhead it said 1 Thessalonians, but uh, his letter uh, was there to them. Let me read starting in verse 6. But now when Timotheus came from you unto us and brought us good tidings of your faith and charity and that ye have good remembrance of us always, desiring greatly to see us as we also to see you, therefore, brethren, we were comforted over you in all our affliction and distress by your faith. For now we live if ye stand fast in the Lord. Because of what he heard, he, he wrote this letter. You know, today we have a lot of ways to contact people. I, I don't even know all the names of the methods that people can use now uh, to be in, in touch. Um, we have no excuse for not being a blessing uh, to each other. Uh, Paul wrote, and his letter was God's word, I and mean, we can't do that, uh, but we do have God's word, and we can share that. Uh, with each other. We can get into it ourselves. You know, God's Word is our main help. There's lots of different things we can turn to, but the main help we'll have in our times of distress and in our times of temptation is the Word of God. Now, that's why Satan attacks the Word of God. He always has. I, I don't know if you knew it. I, I just learned this this week. Between the years 100 and 300, Historians have labeled the ten pagan persecutions. There were ten main persecutions in those 200 years when uh, ungodly people, if they found a Bible manuscript, they burned it. If you owned it, they killed you. Uh, there were terrible times for Christians, very difficult. And yet, people lived and loved the Lord and believed His Word. Uh, false churches began to be established. Uh, some became known as official churches. Uh, from the years 600 to 1600, the so-called official church forbid people to read the Bible. Can you imagine? For a thousand years, their rule was, don't read the Bible. Real faith is just believing what we tell you about it. Well, you believe that, uh, uh, you're in trouble. Uh, today, many false translations and, and misuses of, of God's Word. Satan is always attacking God's Word. But we have God's promise. The word of the Lord endureth forever. Right. Satan can't take it away. Uh, we need to, to learn God's word. We need to learn to read it, to trust it, to obey it. It's God's word. God's word is our main help. Paul wrote to them, and uh, that was of, of help to them. And because God's word is our main help, we need to use it ourselves, first of all. You know, to be a minister to others, first of all, you have to be ministered to, you have to have an understanding. The Bible is called the sword of the Spirit. You want the Holy Spirit working in your life? Get, his Holy, get his, the sword of the Spirit working. Uh, it's what Jesus used to resist Satan. It was the Word of God. 
in uh, chapter 2 of 1 Thessalonians, verse 13, it tells us it works. He says, They believed God's word, the word of God, which effectually worketh also in you that believe. Now, it has to be put into action by faith, but it works. Uh, in Hebrews, he says, God's word is quick and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword. It's alive and powerful, and it works. It, it'll cut between the soul and spirit. You'll be able to see what God is, is doing in your life. And because God's word is our main help, we need to use it on others. You know, it's not enough just to give someone a pat on the back. Or, I mean, that, that's nice, and it's not enough just to give them a smile. We need to give them God's word. We need to do it in, uh, in the way that, that God says, the servant of the Lord must not strive, but be gentle unto all men, apt to teach. And the way we teach is by using God's word. Uh, the Thessalonians did. And he describes them there in verse 6, where we read, as people of faith and charity, and they have good remembrance of us. Uh, they were people that were known for their faith. They were known for their charity. And when he says remembrance of us, they were people of prayer. They remembered Paul. They prayed for him. Uh, those are qualities that we need. Those are qualities that we need to teach to each other. They're qualities that God can give us. So, they were separated. Uh, Paul wanted to see them established. He didn't want to see them fail. So he sent a helper. Then he wrote a letter. And then thirdly, let's, we'll read from verse 9 on down, he prayed for them. For what thanks can we render to God again for you? For all the joy wherewith we joy for your sakes before our God, night and day praying exceedingly that we might see your face and might perfect that which is lacking in your faith. Now God himself and our Father and our Lord Jesus Christ direct our way unto you. And the Lord make you to in increase and abound in love one toward another and toward all men, even as we do toward you. To the end he may establish your hearts unblameable in holiness before God, even our Father, at the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ with all his saints. And he prayed for them. You know, prayer is such a vital part of the Christian life. Uh, I think sometimes it, it's so, it, it's, it's just like breathing. We, it becomes so, uh, such a natural part of our life that sometimes we minimize it. But let me tell you, if you ever have a time when you can't breathe, you'll understand how important it is. <laughs> uh, and prayer is like that. Uh, it, it's just such a vital part of our Christian life. You can see briefly there what some of the things he prayed about for them. In verse 9, he thanked God for them. You know, thankfulness is a, is a good thing. He prayed that in verse 10 that he'd be able to see them. That's not a selfish thing. Uh, that's a good thing. It's a personal thing. In verses 10 and 11, he prayed that their faith would grow. In verse 12, he prayed that they would increase and abound in love. And then in verse 13, he prayed that they would consistently live holy lives. Those are some great things uh, to pray for, uh, for someone. Quite often in uh, the epistles, you'll find that Paul talks about things he's praying about for people. Uh, for instance, in Colossians chapter 1, he talks about praying for them. and He says he prayed that they be, would be filled with the knowledge of his will, that they might walk worthy of the Lord, that they might be strengthened. These are, these are real things to pray about. You know, folks, we need to move past just saying, God bless Doyla, and God bless Azrael, and God bless Kate. Uh, you know, if that's all we pray, well, that's better than nothing. But we need to move past that uh, to praying real things for each other. And I would encourage you to take a look in, in the Bible and see how people prayed for each other. And Take note of that. Pray that for me. I'll, I'll pray that for you. And then we need to put feet to our prayers as God shows us what to do. Uh, there'll be times when you're praying for someone and you'll think, I should, I should phone them. I should write them. Uh, I should help them. You know, when you're praying about a need and you can meet that need, man, go for it. Uh, we need to be people of prayer. We're praying for each other that will be established in the Lord. Uh, like he, he said there in Thessalonians, and in verse, verse 3, that no man should be moved by these afflictions, for yourselves know that we are appointed thereunto. You know, God knows what we're going through. God knew ahead of time. He's, he's not surprised by our situation. And God has said he'll go with us. 
God has said he'll, he'll see us through. Uh, we need to not be moved by these afflictions. Uh, we need to be, make sure that we're saved. We need to have a servant's heart. Uh, we need to be willing to work. But I want you to notice something at the end of, of this chapter. It's true at the end of each chapter in, in Thessalonians. He mentions Christ's return. In verses 12 and 13, the Lord make you to an increase in an, and abound in love one toward another and toward all men, even as we do toward you. To the end, he may establish your hearts unblameable in holiness before God, even our Father, at the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ with all his saints. And one of the, the motivations for us is Jesus is coming. And it could be today. We say, oh, we have such affliction and trouble and temptations. Well, Jesus could come today. And we need to make sure that our hearts are established unblameable in holiness before God. It's a purifying hope. At the end of chapter 2, he had mentioned verse 19 and 20. What is our hope or joy or crown of rejoicing? Are not even ye in the presence of our Lord Jesus Christ at his coming? For ye are our glory and joy. Uh, I would call that a working hope. Because we have hope, we're... Uh, we're committed to each other and we're committed to the Lord and we're committed to the work of the ministry and we're, we're looking forward to that time when we're not only with Jesus, but we're like Jesus. It's a working hope. At the end of chapter 1, he had said in verse 9, They themselves show of us what manner of entering in we had unto you and how you turned to God from idols to serve the living and true God and to wait for his Son from heaven, whom he raised from the dead, even Jesus, which delivered us from the wrath to come. It's an inspiring hope. As we're going through trouble, Jesus is coming. And he's delivered us uh, from the wrath to come. Jesus is coming again. And the, the main question you need to ask yourself this morning, do you know the Lord? Do you know the Lord? Uh, Paul was able to send Timothy because he was a brother. He had a, a strong testimony of, of salvation, unfeigned faith. Have you turned to God, like he, he said there in chapter 1, verse 9, from your own life, from a life of idol, idolatry? The only way to God is through Jesus Christ. The devil, the world, the flesh will point out all different ways that you think you could go. God says there's only one way. Jesus is the only way. And uh, if you've never trusted Christ as your Savior... You can do that today. The Bible says in Romans 10, 13, Whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. What a wonderful promise. Uh, he's the Savior. Uh, I want to encourage you this morning. Let's determine by God's grace to be faithful followers of the Lord, to reach out to others and help them to do the same. Let me encourage you. Remember the Lord. Let's go to Him in, in prayer this morning. Father, we are so grateful. Thank you for your goodness. Thank you for all the help that you give us for your word, for your Holy Spirit, Lord, for other Christians, Lord, for the, the means we have of communication. Thank you, Father, for your promise that you'll never leave us or forsake us. Lord, I pray if there are those listening today that are not saved, that they would trust you as their Savior today. Father, help us to honor you. Help us to be your servants. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. God bless you.